All right, now on to the final part of this lecture. We're going to talk now about electron transport chains and oxidative phosphorylation. What I'd like you to learn from this lecture and the accompanying reading in Chapter 4 is that I would like you to have an understanding of how electron transport chains are constructed and organized in the cell. I'd like you to understand the flow of electrons from electron carriers through electron transport chains, which I will be abbreviating ETC, okay, and ultimately to terminal electron acceptors. And I'd like you to understand how the proton motive force is generated, what a proton motive force is, and how it energizes ATP synthase. So respiration can be aerobic or anaerobic. And if, if it's anaerobic, then you're using a terminal electron acceptor other than oxygen. Missing a closing bracket there. The terminal electron acceptor in, in respiration is always exogenous or external to the process. Okay. The goal in respiration is to transfer electrons from the primary donor to the terminal electron acceptor. At the level of the electron transport chain, the electrons are moving from electron carriers, such as NADH, to the terminal electron acceptor. So during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, we've stripped electrons off the original primary donor and its subsequent metabolites. We've placed all those electrons onto electron carriers, such as NADH, or also FADH2 or if, for example, in photosynthesis, it could be NADPH, okay? And then those diffusible electron carriers have diffused to the protein complexes that make up the electron transport chain. At the electron transport chain, we have those electrons flowing through the components of the electron transport chain and ultimately to the terminal electron acceptor. The electron flow is energy, and that energy is harnessed to create a proton motive force, and that proton motive force is then harnessed to run ATP synthase and also to accomplish other important functions such as transport or running a flagellum. Electron transport chains are membrane associated suites of electron carriers, including enzymes and various molecules. Remember that this is all about redox. Electrons are always transferred in an electron transport chain from one chemical species to another and it always has to be from one chemical species to another that has a more um, negative, sorry, a more positive redox potential. So let's look at electron transport chains in some detail. Let's Let's go through the list of what's actually in an electron transport chain. So this is a cartoon figure of complex 1 that is found in, electron, in most electron transport chains, in microbial and uh, non-microbial electron transport chains. And a very important um, part of complex 1 is the enzyme NADH dehydrogenase. I actually mentioned this in an earlier part of this lecture. NADH dehydrogenase enzymes are enzymes that bind to NADH, catalyzing their oxidation to NAD+. That's what's happening here. Okay? So although it's not written in this particular cartoon, as is the case in the cartoons found in Chapter 4 of your textbook, in here, in this big green protein complex, is an NADH dehydrogenase and it binds to NADH and it catalyzes its oxidation to NAD plus and a proton. Okay. The um, NADH dehydrogenases can accept two protons and two electrons from NADH and it will transmit both to a flavin mononucleotide. Flavin mononucleotide, which is written here, is part of a flavoprotein. Remember, FMN is a prosthetic group, okay, able to accept and transmit electrons. This is basically um, complex 1, which is shown here, also contains an iron sulfur protein. We'll talk about that in a moment. And it is essentially the beginning of the electron transport chain. So this is the, the depot or the deposit site for NADH. It's where all the NADH generated 
in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle end up. They're going to attach to complex 1, specifically at the NADH dehydrogenase, and they're going to deposit electrons there. As they do that, they're going to yield protons, and those protons are going to become part of the proton motive force. There's some of the protons that are actively pumped across the membrane. So what else is in an electron transport chain? Flavoproteins, which contain flavin mononucleotide and flavin adenine dinucleotide, are also in um, uh, electron transport chains, for example, in complex one. So both FMN and FAD are prosthetic groups. I discussed them in an earlier part of this lecture. I mentioned them that they were vitamin derivatives, but more specifically, they're derivatives of the vitamin riboflavin. They accept protons and electrons, but they themselves only transfer electrons. Okay? FMN is associated with a flavor protein in complex 1, which I just showed you, and FAD is found in uh, associated with a flavor protein in complex 2, which we'll look at in a few moments. So on the left is the oxidized form of F. Uh, MN and on the right is the reduced form. We've looked at a similar figure earlier and so I won't spend additional time on that uh, herein. What else is in electron transport chains? Well really important components of electron transport chains are cytochromes. So cytochromes are proteins that contain heme groups and a heme group is shown in here, okay, associated with the brown which is protein. Okay, so um, hemes are prosthetic groups, right? They are uh, a part of proteins so that they can accept and transmit electrons. So um, hemes are capable, and, or most cytochromes in fact, which contain hemes, are capable of one electron transfers, and that is mediated using the iron, the Fe, in the center of the heme group, shown here. Okay. There are a lot of different kinds of cytochromes in cells. So while they've been evolutionarily conserved into classes that are designated by letters, as for example, cytochrome A, cytochrome B, cytochrome C, um, there's still some diversity within those classes, and so there's an additional numbering system. For example, you can have cytochrome A1 or cytochrome A2 and so on. Each species will have its own particular suite of cytochrome proteins. These proteins are really good at complexing with other cytochromes and also complexing with iron sulfur proteins, which we'll talk about in a moment. They don't carry or transfer protons, so they just accept electrons and they just transmit electrons. They themselves don't sort of manage or deal with protons. In electron transport chains, they are found associated with complexes 3 and 4. What else is in an electron transport chain? Iron, uh, electron transport chains have iron sulfur proteins, or FES proteins. These are um, proteins that contain non-heme iron clustered with sulfur atoms. Two really common configurations are shown there on the left in parts A and B of the figure. So it's very common to have two irons, two sulfurs, as is shown in A part, or to have, um, we've got one, two, three, four uh, sulfurs, one, two, three, four um, irons, as shown in the bottom part. Notice the importance of cysteine here. Cysteine um, covalently bonds with these iron sulfur complexes, helping to coordinate or organize them into the iron sulfur protein. You can have a variety of conformation, meaning number of irons, and sulfurs, and therefore a variety in the redox potential of iron sulfur proteins. That means that they can, different iron sulfur proteins can occupy a variety of positions in the complexes that make up an electron transport chain. Their job is to carry electrons, not protons, and um, electron transport chain complexes 1 and 3 uh, tend to have a lot of iron sulfur proteins associated with them. Right, so some of my favorite parts of electron transport chains are non-proteins. They are small organic hydrophobic molecules known as quinones. So quinones are really good electron carrying molecules and they are 
um, diffusible, so they uh, provide some mobility, basically, for electrons as they move or flow through the electron transport chain. The quinones are very useful in connecting complexes. Um, for example, they connect complexes 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 in the electron transport chain that we're going to look at in a moment. They can accept protons and electrons, but they can transfer only electrons. So here we see the oxidized form on the top and the reduced form on the bottom. So this oxidized form is accepting two hydrogen atoms and therefore accepting the, the um, hydrogens and electrons associated with it. And down here it is showing us the reduced form. Coenzyme Q is the specific quinone that has been shown here and it's probably the most common one in um, most microbial electron transport chains. Let's now put um, the different parts of an electron transport chain together and think about electron flow and think about proton production and pumping. First let's address the protons. Here we've got protons and they are accumulating to create a proton motive force. This is the outside, this is the inside of the cell. Okay. Over here we've got ATP production. Remember ATP is always produced inside the cell. Cells never make ATP on the outside because that would be wasteful. So that's one way that you can always tell what's the inside and what's the outside. All right, the protons, where do they come from? They come from two places. One, they come from NADH. Okay, when it's oxidized it yields protons. And two, they come from water dissociation. Okay, so that's the sources of the protons and they are being actively pumped using these uh, proteins embedded in the membrane is all together called the electron transport chain. They're being actively pumped so that they accumulate on the outside of the cell creating an electrochemical gradient known as the proton motive force. All right, let's think about the electron flow now, because it is the electron flow that provides the energy for these protein complexes to pump protons across the membrane. So and, uh, this is a simplified version of an electron transport chain than the one shown in your book. And what is not shown here is the complex that your book refers to as complex 2, which would be at about this position, and in the figure in your book, which we'll look at next, plays the role of accepting FADH2. This is a simpler version as is found in other cells. Okay, There are different versions of electron transport chains in all the different critters on Earth. So here we have NADH coming from other places in the cell like glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and it is attaching to this protein and this protein is often called complex 1. It includes NADH dehydrogenase which catalyzes this oxidation. That starts to get the electrons flowing at the electron transport chain. So electrons are coming from NADH into the NADH dehydrogenase and this may also have iron sulfur proteins in it and flavoproteins in it. Okay? The electrons will flow from one to the other always from uh, something that is a good, a very negative redox potential to something that has a more positive redox potential and then ultimately they'll end up in the quinone pool which is shown here so here quinones are being reduced and then oxidized as they drop electrons off at the cytochrome BC1 complex, which is complex 3. This was 1. For comparison to the figure in your book, 2 is not shown, but it would be down here. Okay. So cytochrome BC1 complex contains cytochromes of B type and C1 type, and they're going to transmit electrons one to the other and then they're going to transmit them to the protein known as cytochrome C, which is actually attached to this membrane, not loosely floating in space as this figure implies. The electrons will go from cytochrome C over to complex 4. And at complex 4, they sort of meet the end of the game from the point of view of electrons in that they are going to end up on oxygen, reducing that oxygen to water. Okay, and so there is the terminal electron acceptor. Okay, that's the end of the game for the electrons. That electron flow is what's providing the energy for the active extrusion or pumping of protons, creating the proton motive force.
an electrical potential. And that electro electrical potential is harnessed by the enzyme ATP synthase, so it has a channel through which protons flow moving down gradient back into the cell. That energizes ATP synthase, allowing a rotor to turn, and that allows ATP synthase to catalyze the reaction whereby ADP and phosphate, inorganic phosphate, join to form ATP. All right, let's look at the figure in your book that puts all this together. It's more complex, so I wanted to look at this simpler figure first. This is the electron transport chain from a well-studied organism known as Paracoccus denitrophens, shown here is the electron transport chain of P. denitrificans as it would play a role using aerobic respiration. There's oxygen, that's how I know it's aerobic. This uh, particular organism, though, is actually capable of some anaerobic metabolisms as well. So what I like about this figure is that it shows a little bit more about what is making up the complexes that make up the electron transport chain. And I also like the fact that it shows the redox potential so that we can refer back to our knowledge of the electron tower. So let's kind of walk through this one at a time. Here's complex one, all right? There's a quinone pool, here's complex two, complex three, complex four, and here's cytochrome C, shown a little better because it's actually attached to this membrane, okay? So enzymes, or sorry, electrons are, are arriving in two ways. Here's NADH, okay? And here is FADH2, which can also arrive at this position. Okay, so the NADH is bringing electrons in, and it's got a redox potential of negative 0.32 volts, okay, and it's going to drop off its uh, electrons in here, not written, which is a bit annoying, is a protein known as NADH dehydrogenase, okay, also is a flavoprotein that contains FMN and iron sulfur protein. So these are all complex together into complex one. So the NADH dehydrogenase removes those electrons and it transmits them to the flavoprotein and then it transmits them from the flavoprotein to the iron sulfur protein and from the iron sulfur protein to the quinone cycle. So that's going to be reduced to form QH2 and notice we're moving from relatively negative redox potentials to increasingly more positive redox potentials as the electrons flow down the electron transport chain or through the electron transport chain. The quinones, the quinone pool is able to accept electrons from FADH2 and that's helping to drive this quinone cycle and the quinone, uh, quinones in their reduced form will drop electrons off to complex 2 Okay. There can be a little bit of reverse flow as well, and we're not going to get into why that is right now, so I really want you to just focus on the electrons flowing here. So the electrons are going to flow over to complex 2. Complex 2 has cytochrome B and C in it, and it also includes some iron sulfur protein. The electrons are going to flow through complex 2 and then out to cytochrome C on the um, external side of the membrane and then from there over to complex 4 and from complex 4 they're going to end up on oxygen so they're going to work with protons and the new electrons flowing through the electron transport chain to reduce oxygen to water so there is the terminal electron acceptor okay just like we uh, discussed in the previous figure again if you look down the redox potentials you're going from very negative redox potentials to very positive redox potentials. That's allowing this to happen. It is therefore thermodynamically or energetically possible. Okay. Note the proton pumping. So here we've got protons being actively extruded through complex ones. So while it's moving electrons, it's also able to transmit protons. We've got some protons being extruded as a result of the work of the quinone cycle. And we've got... Um, protons 
as part of complex four that are being actively extruded um, across the membrane. Remember the source of those protons was NADH and also the dissociation of water. Okay, and so that's a little bit about uh, electron transport chains. Let's carry on. And finally we get to ATP synthase and the proton motive force. So ATP synthase is a multi-protein cytoplasmic protein complex that is embedded in the cytoplasmic membrane. It's a complex organized into the F1 region, which is oriented on the inside or the cytoplasm side. So that's in here. Sorry, this is the opposite of the figure that we looked at two slides ago. And this is out. Okay. Remember, ATP is always produced inside the cell. So let's look at the different bits and pieces here. Here's the F1 part. It's a protruding knob that contains catalytic sites that join inorganic phosphate to make to uh, ADP in order to make ATP. So that's its job. It's to actually catalyze this reaction. That's the F1 portion or region. We also have a rod that connects the cylindrical rotor portion, which we're going to get to next, and spins it, activating catalytic sites in the F1. We have the F0 or F0 site, which functions like a motorboat rotor, and it is found in the cytoplasmic membrane. It spins clockwise when it's doing the work of ATP synthesis. So when protons are flowing through it down the proton gradient, when they're flowing this way, okay, then it will spin um, clockwise like this, and that will cause the rod to spin, and that will trigger um, catalysis due to the F1 portions. So this is a very ancient protein. It's been highly conserved. All cells have ATP synthase, and their job is to make ATP. Um, they're also used for um, some other uh, processes. So um, this is oxidative phosphorylation, that which is the synthesis of ATP utilizing ATP synthase, which is energized through the proton motive force. I want you to also note that ATP synthase in phototrophic organism works in the same way. It's just that the proton motive force is generated using energy from photosynthetic reactions instead of the successive oxidation of high energy compounds. So in that case, um, we call it photophosphorylation, something I mentioned in an earlier lecture. All right. So using the resources that you have available to you, chiefly chapter four of your textbook, I want you to use uh, and answer the study question, fermentative microbes still have ATP synthase, what for? And a hint as you go about uh, answering that question is that in addition to running ATP synthase and using it to generate ATP, what is the proton motive force used for in cells? In other words, why would a fermentative microbe, just like a respiratory microbe, need to have a proton motive force. You should be able to list in total three purposes for a proton motive force and that should give you an indication of why fermentative microbes still have ATP synthase. Another hint that I haven't written here but it is that in some organisms ATP synthase can actually run backwards. So think about that a little bit and please comprise an answer to this question for your study notes. With that, this will now conclude this last lecture on the topic of metabolism.